Hello, everyone. This is Joseph Holbrook, professor of history at Florida International University. I am teaching a new class, at least new for me, called Introduction to Christianity. And uh, this is in the fall of 2022 as part of our certificate in Christian studies that uh, is being inaugurated this fall. And I'm using a textbook by Alistair McGrath where he we left off in chapter four, the Reformation, actually chapter three, the Reformation. And then I had technical difficulties. My laptop went into the shop and I proceeded to go through three laptops in four weeks and lost some of my data. So I'm back and uh, ready to resume this series. Although I'm going to return later this week to pick up on the Reformation. And right now we're going to continue with the Enlightenment. So bear with me as we get started here. This is uh, the modern age, the Enlightenment. Uh, the modern age being 1650 through the 1914. And uh, we'll pick it up there. Okay. So this is our outline for today. Uh, the modern age will encompass the age of reason or the enlightenment, which we'll start with today. And as a result of the enlightenment, there arises a attitude of indifference socially towards religion, or at least traditional religion. Uh, we'll discuss briefly the enlightenment and Christianity, Christian beliefs in the age of reason, uh, if there's time, we'll continue with pietism and revival in Germany and England. The Great Awakening in America, I suspect that that'll be part two this week. And also the suppression of the Jesuits in 1759. And the American Revolution and the influence of the Great Awakening on the American Re Revolution. So, at the opening of the 16th century, Christianity was basically confined to Europe. It was a European religion. Uh, there, of course, there was a strong presence of Christianity in the Middle East, in Syria, Palestine, Egypt, under the uh, domination of Muslims. But nonetheless, they were still there. Uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, Iran, uh, that has since changed in the 21st century and it's greatly reduced. Spain was no longer under Moorish control as of 1592. And other parts of Europe were under threat, despite the fact that Spain had been liberated from the Moors. The Byzantine Empire had crumbled, with the Turkish Ottoman Empires deeply embedded in the Balkans. The Balkans are the area north of Greece, uh, north of Macedonia, uh, the Slavic countries, Serbia, we'll talk about them later. With the fall of Constantinople in 1453, there was little resistance to the Ottoman advance into Eastern Europe. Uh, it was a time of considerable anxiety for many in Western Europe, especially in Germany. And why Germany, would you ask? That's because the uh, Ottoman uh, military advanced all the way to Vienna and were uh, on outside the walls of Vienna and uh, this threatened Germany with uh, uh, Turkish domination or Muslim domination. However, there was a decisive defeat of the Ottoman naval forces at the Battle of Lepanto in 1571, which allowed the Western European powers to refocus their attention on the expansion of their spheres of influence in America, Africa, and Asia. The Catholic naval powers, which were Spain and Portugal, uh, launched major maritime explorations, leading to the colonization and a massive expansion of their political influence and economic resources. The Age of Discovery, quote-unquote, that's a bit of a uh, euphemism, Others would call it an age of genocide or an age of conquest. Maybe would be a better middle term. Exploration and conquest reached its 
climax during the 16th and the early 17th centuries, and it saw an enlargement of the European presence and influence globally in the Americas, Africa, and Asia, although I will tend to focus more on the Americas because that's my field of expertise. Also, the England got involved in this uh, expansion along, uh, the, the, actually the Dutch are overlooked. The Dutch were major players in this global expansion, especially into Asia. But the English also arrived and began to establish colonies in the New England region, in the Virginia re region, eventually in the Carolinas, also Barbados. The Church of England was regarded as the established colonial church in these territories. However, the most active religious congregations were immigrant communities, primarily consisting of refugees from religious persecution in England. Tensions began to develop between the Puritans and Anglicans, the Anglicans being the Church of England. Uh, these tensions would contribute to the origins of the American Revolution in 1776. The global expansion of Christian European nations led to a new era, opening up the Christ history of Christianity, raising new questions about the interaction of faith and culture. Despite the expansion into the Americas, back in its original heartlands in Europe, tensions were developing that would lead to a sea change in the attitudes towards religions in the area. The massive damage caused by the, to the European economies by the wars of religion of the 17th century caused many to wonder how such traumas might be avoided in the future. One of those wars of religion was the the so-called Thirty Years' War, which ended in 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia, which might lead you to believe it began in 1618. Uh, it, the 1648 Peace of Westphalia base, basically ushered in the modern era of modern nation-states and a certain minor degree of uh, religious toleration. Uh, this also ushered in the Age of Reason, otherwise known as the European Enlightenment. I might also add that as, at the end of the uh, Thirty Years' War, in Germany, primarily between Protestant Lutherans and Reformed or Calvinists versus the uh, Cat Roman Catholics, one half of all German men were dead. This was a devastating war that uh, left Europeans exhausted and weary of religious disagreements. In England, the Civil War and its de debilitating aftermath had exa exhausted any enthusiasm for religious partisanship. This was roughly in the uh, 1630s, 1620s, 30s, and 40s, the uh, English Civil War. It was a conflict between royalists and republicans not modern Republicans, but those uh, Englishmen who favored a Republican form of government between nobility and the rising middle class and between the Anglicans and the Puritans. The Puritans representing the rising middle class and the Republican faction. Uh, this had exhausted the country and there was a restoration of the monarchy in 1660 that led to a new religious crisis. When Charles II was succeeded by James II, who was a Catholic, and who appointed co-religionists to prominent positions in the state army and the universities. This prompted widespread concern, and a new religious war seemed inevitable. Now, you might, un you might be sympathetic to their hypervigilance, because a lot of people died over religious disagreements. Today, people just call each other names on Twitter and hurl anathemas and heresy, charges of heresy. But back in those days, you could die if you uh, had a religious disagreement. And so this is why they were hypervigilant. Uh, this uh, new resolution was called the Glorious Revolution, 1688. James II had a daughter named Mary who had earlier married William III who was a Prince of Orange, 
which was a location in Holland. And he was a firmly committed Protestant with a reputation for tolerance and generosity. So he was married to James II's daughter, Mary. William uh, was persuaded by the uh, Puritans and Protestants, Anglicans and Puritans, I suppose, who were feared a, a return of Catholicism. They persuaded William of Orange to come with Mary to be take the throne of England as a Protestant, as a as two Protestant monarchs. So William landed in the west of England in 1688 with widespread public support. They were declared king and queen of England in February, but only after agreeing to sign a Bill of Rights, which guaranteed free elections and freedom of speech. The Glorious Revolution had averted another civil war and limited both the power of religion and the monarchy in English public life. So this brings us to John Locke's Letters of Toleration. Uh, it was no accident that John Locke's Letters of Toleration were published at this precise moment, arguing for the need to tolerate at least some degree of diversity in religion rather than allowing it to lead to conflict. Locke argued for limited religious toleration. It is impossible for the state to adjudicate between competing religious truth claims. An example of this can be seen in the early United States when Pennsylvania was Quaker, New York was Jewish and Dutch Reformed, New England was Congregational, Rhode Island was Baptist, uh, North Carolina and Virginia were Episcopalian or Church of England, and there were Methodists scattered almost everywhere. So how would the state decide which one of those religions would be the official religion. The state's not competent to do that. The results of trying to impose religious uniformity are far worse than those which would result from the continuing existence of diversity, according to John Locke. He looks a little sad, probably because nobody listened to his, uh, well, people did listen to him. Okay, so we don't know why he's sad. This brings us to deism. Wearied with religious controversy, many leading Western European thinkers of the 18th century came to believe that civil peace and religious toleration, toleration would be based on a non-dogmatic faith, some form of deism. This new mood was expressed in a growing interest in using human reason. Rather than the contested claims of divine revelation, or the ecclesiastical authority, using human reason as the basis of human philosophy and ethics. Not only would this set these important areas of thought apart from the violence and fanaticism of religion, but it would help uh, maintain the peace. Many English writers began to develop approaches to religion which accepted the notion of a creator God who had implanted reason within the human soul as a basis for judgment. Thereafter, God was of no relevance. God may have created the world, but that's as far as it went, according to deists. The famous image of God as the divine watchmaker emerged in the late 17th century. God had created a wonderful mechanical universe which once created could regulate itself without further divine attention, said the deists. And by the way, for those who affer want to assert that the founders of the United States were Christians, in fact, most of them were deists. Certainly Thomas Jefferson was a deist, James Madison, probably Benjamin Franklin, uh, George Washington was a rather nominal um, uh, member of the Church of England. Uh, John Adams was a Unitarian. So uh, that can be easily debated. The origins of the Enlightenment lie partly in the English deism, a movement which developed in the late 17th century. Sir Isaac Newton had argued that the universe was like a uh, vast machine, rationally designed and constructed by an intelligent creator. 
Deism minimized the supernatural dimensions of faith and presented Christianity essentially as a rational and moral religion, easily harmonized with human reason. God was the creator of the kind of regular, ordained, uh, ordered universe that Newtonian mechanics had uncovered. The critical use of reason allowed Enlightenment thinkers to incline themselves to disposing of what they regarded as the unnecessary supernatural baggage of the Christian faith. Uh, then the first phase of this development uh, of the Enlightenment was the late 17th century when it was argued that the beliefs of Christianity were rational and thus capable of standing up to critical scrutiny. In the second phase, it was argued that the basic ideas of Christianity being rational could be derived directly from reason itself without the need for divine revelation. In the final phase of this transition, by the middle of the 18th century, leading representatives of the Enlightenment confidently affirmed the ability to re of reason to judge revelation. Some Anglican clergy and bishops found its ideas compelling. Deism, a belief in a generic creator God, seemed much less intellectually demanding and tiresome than the Trinitarian God of the Christian tradition. It resonated well with the new emphasis on the divine ordering of the world now emerging from the mechanical philosophy of Isaac Newton and his school. God could be thought of as the divine clockmaker who had constructed the particularly elegant piece of machinery and made no demands of anyone other than a due appreciation of the beauty of the creation. Religions of all kinds tend to be seen as corruptions of an original religion of nature, which had no priests or creeds. These latter were later distortions introduced by self-serving clerics, anxious to secure their social status and exploit the gullible. If the appeal of the Enlightenment proved greatest within Reformed circles, now, in case you don't realize what they're, that signals, Reformed equals Calvinism. So wherever Calvinism became, took precedence, uh, those churches are called Reformed, as opposed to Lutheran or Anabaptist or Roman Catholic. And that would Reformed... Uh, Territories would include much of Switzerland, Holland, uh, New England, these, Scotland. These were areas where Calvinism uh, held sway, even parts of England. For reasons that remain unclear, rationalism gained a wider acceptance at many strongholds of Calvinism. Geneva and Edinburgh both uh, international centers of Calvinism in the late 16th and early 17th centuries became epicenters of European rationalism in the late 18th. The religious worldviews of John Calvin and John Knox gave way to those of rationalists and skeptics such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau and David Hume. In marked contrast, the Enlightenment had relatively little impact on Catholicism. And the notes, the textbook does not mention this, but as far as I know, it had almost absolutely no impact on Eastern Orthodoxy. We had a discussion in our class about why that might be. If Eastern Orthodoxy maintains a much larger uh, room for divine mystery, even than Roman Catholicism, and Roman Catholicism certainly maintains more space for divine mystery than some kinds of Protestantism, particularly Calvinism. So that rationalism of the Calvinist system, systematic theology uh, might have left it open to, uh, left it vulnerable to the rationalism of the Enlightenment. You can co come to your own conclusion, but it's something worth thinking about. Although the Enlightenment criticisms would apply to any religious system that accepted the notion of divine revelation, including Judaism and Islam, Christianity was the historically dominant religion in those parts of the world in which the Enlightenment gained hold. Unsurprisingly, most Enlightenment critics of religion in general chose to direct those criticisms against many aspects of the traditional Christian
Christian belief and practice. A classic example of such a criticism is found in the rationalist criticism of the traditional Christian doctrine of God as, as three in one, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This was widely ridiculed by Enlightenment thinkers who held it to be logically absurd. How could any rational person accept such mathematical nonsense? In contrast, by the way, uh, some Eastern Orthodox theologians will say that as soon as you attempt to describe or define the Trinity, you already have messed up, because attempting to apply rational definitions to the Trinity is to diminish it. That would be an Eastern Orthodox perspective. In a letter to Timothy Pickering dated February 27, 1821, Jefferson complained that the, of the apparent irrationality of the notion of the Trinity, demanding to get rid of the incomprehensible jargon of the Trinitarian arithmetic. Under the pressure of such rationalist criticism, many Orthodox Christian thinkers de-emphasized the doctrine of the Trinity. Believing that it was impossible to mount an effective defense of this doctrine given the spirit of the age. Throughout the period of the Enlightenment, rationalist pressure led to many Christian theologians developing approaches to the doctrine of God which came close to deism. This is what the fundamentalists will say in their criticism of the liberal Protestantism in 1910. The second area of Christian belief to come under criticism was the identity of Jesus of Nazareth. As we've noted earlier, the Council of Nicaea had declared that Christianity was committed to and based upon the firm conviction that Jesus was both divine and human. This idea was regarded as irrational and illogical by writers sympathetic to the Enlightenment. There was, they declared, a serious discrepancy between the real Jesus of history and the New Testament interpretation of his significance. It was argued that it was possible to go beyond the New Testament accounts of Jesus and to uncover a simpler, more human Jesus who would be acceptable to the new spirit of the age. This conviction triggered the quest of the historical Jesus, an intellectual search for a more rational understanding of the person of Jesus. The Enlightenment was characterized by an increasingly critical attitude to the very idea of supernatural revelation. In the first place, it was unnecessary. In the second, it lacked the universality of human reason, because your supernatural re revelation may be diametrically opposed to my supernatural revelation. Everyone had access to reason. Only a select few had access to revelation. So the phrase, the scandal of particularity, was used by the Enlightenment writers in expressing their concerns about the traditional notion of relation, revelation at this point. And this brings us to pietism in Germany, uh, initiated by Philip Jacob Spinner as a result of the cold backsliding of third and fourth generation Lutherans. And I am going to stop here and continue later this week with a second lecture on the rest of this uh, period of enlightenment and pietism and the Jesuits' expulsion from the Americas. Okay. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, we will be continuing on onwards and upwards in our introduction to Christianity this semester. Uh, and I hope you'll stay with us. Thank you very much. Take care.